Welcome to another edition of This Week in Legal Blogging. This is Bob Ambrogi. I am the uh, author of the blog Law Sites and the host of the podcast Law Next. And this program is produced and presented by Lex Blog, in which we feature conversations with notable legal bloggers. You can find all of our past conversations at youtube.com slash lexblog. And today I'm very happy to be joined by Kevin LaCroix. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing well, Bob. Thank you for having me. Good to talk to you. Um, and Kevin is an attorney. He is the executive vice president of RT Pro Exec, which is a division of RT Specialty LLC. Uh, but more to the point, he is the author of the blog, The DNO Diary, which is described as a periodic journal containing items of interest from the world of directors and officers liability, a blog he's been doing for 14 years now. That's right. So, uh, Kevin, before we get to your blog, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do in your day job? So, uh, as Colin mentioned, or as you mentioned, rather, I, I'm an attorney, um, and I early in my career, I was a practicing attorney. I was a, ultimately a partner in a Pennsylvania Avenue law firm, um, had an entrepreneurial opportunity after almost uh, 15 years of conventional legal practice to become claims counsel for a startup insurance company, which subsequently was bought by a unit of Berkshire Hathaway. The guy that hired me uh, retired. I took over the company and I ran it for 10 years. Um, and then in a series of uh, mishaps, I wound up resigning from that job, started a new career uh, with uh, a company called Oak Ridge Insurance Services, which uh, for purposes of this conversation, I'll simply describe as an insurance intermediary placing insurance for publicly traded companies. We were acquired by RT Specialty in December 2010. So for nearly 10 years, I've been a part of RT Specialty. The, the professional liability unit, RT Pro Exec, is, is the unit that I work for. Oh, okay. So that's because uh, I was looking at, uh, so your blog, you started your blog uh, in 2006. You were acquired in 2010. Uh, I was somehow thinking that you started your blog when you went to RT, but you had actually started your blog before that acquired. So why, what led you to start a blog back then? Yeah, so, I mean, if, if you picked up from my uh, thumbnail sketch of my biography, I've changed jobs a few times. Yeah, I've well, worn a few hats. Yeah, we all, yeah. And uh, when I made the switch from running um, the you know, liability unit from my prior employer to becoming an insurance wholesale broker, it was an entire change of career. Uh, fortunately, my partners were very supportive, but right at first, uh, the phone wasn't exactly ringing off the hook, and I needed to find something to do just to kind of keep my hand in and kind of fill the time until the phone did start to ring. So literally, I just started playing around with the um, blogging software on Google, and um, really without any intent about it, wound up creating a blog, and then one step led to another. I started writing for it first as an experiment, then with enthusiasm, and it gained momentum, and it became a thing in and of itself. I had no idea when I started all this that 14 years later, I would still be doing it, still enjoying it. So it's just a happy experiment, I guess I would say. Yeah. <laughs> had you been following blogs at that point? Were you, I mean, what did you know about blogging at that point? Uh, a limited amount. There were some in, in my space, there were some that I followed. Uh, there was one that has gone kind of dormant called the 10B5 Daily, um, which was sort of a, in the vanguard of it within our space. There were some others, .NET. Um, and so I was aware of using technology that way. Um, I w had no idea the power um, that was you know, latent in the whole project. Fortunately, that was a happy discovery for myself as time went by. It was really just sort of a technological experiment combined with my general interest in writing, which I've always done throughout my career. Yeah. So at what point did you start to become aware of the power of it? Well, right away, I, I was kind of amazed how quickly my obscure little blog being published in Beechwood, Ohio, uh, came to people's attention. And um, within a few weeks of my launching it, I became aware that others in my industry were actually following it. I was very fortunate with my timing because I launched the blog right at the time that the options backdating scandal broke. 
and I actually had something very concrete to write about. Um, and I found that I was becoming a resource for the issues surrounding that one issue. That was instrumental in building the readership. But as the readership developed, it kind of snowballed because I started getting questions. I started getting inquiries and I started getting an appreciation for the fact that not only was I reading, reaching people that I knew, but I was reaching total strangers and even more interesting, which I never anticipated, it was reaching internationally. Um, from the very beginning and to this day, I have a very large international readership, which was, you know, something I didn't anticipate, but it, I think, is a powerful demonstration of what you can do with a blog. I can sit at my desk in Beachwood, Ohio, and put out something in the internet, and boom, people literally all over the world are reading it, which is really kind of cool. I'm, yeah. It never ceases to amaze me, actually. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's so funny talking to, like, we've been doing this show for week after week now, and, and, the stories are so similar of, of, of legal professionals who started blogging and, and, you know, Lexblog didn't pay you to come and say this stuff. This is not a paid promotion for Lexblog. I mean, this is, I've experienced the same thing in my own career, in my own blogging. Uh, people uh, minimize, I think, the impact of, of a blog. But as you say, it, it, it builds on itself exponentially. You get an audience beyond, I mean, I was in, legal journalism for many years before I started blogging. And I, I mean, I was the editor of the National Law Journal and some other fairly major publications. And nobody knew who I was. I started blogging and suddenly people knew who I was. So, you know, it, it's, it's really great to hear your, your well, story. Well, I have a funny anecdote. I, I have my picture on my blog, so my readers know what I look like. And I've been doing things as strange as walking through uh, Times Square and have people stop me and say, hey, wait a minute, do you write a blog? And <laughs> well, yeah, I do. I've had people on airplanes. I was at a tourist site in Zurich, Switzerland, and a guy stopped me. So, yeah, you're right. It does. It's a, a level of recognition you can't get, even if you've got a very prestigious and high status job. It it doesn't create that sort of uh, certainly facial or name recognition that the blog can do. Yeah, and I and I take it from your biography that you've been uh, your blog has been uh, mentioned in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and and probably other places as well. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that is true, and um, that actually has been kind of a cool thing because um, a lot of the journalists that I have spoken to actually stay in touch and are very frank that they use my blog as a resource for story ideas, and even they will in turn share things that they can't use but they think I might be interested in. So, yeah, it's been very fruitful in that respect. Yeah. So uh, you started you started the blog back when you had uh, basically no book of business at, at this new position you were in. Uh, and uh, you you found a readership for the blog. What about business? <laughs> did, yeah, did, did, how did it go on that front? No, it's a really good question because it's a big time investment. And yeah. sort of, the, you know, the, the econo economist would step back and say, yeah, but is it worth the amount of time you're spending? First of all, I like it. So, yes, it's worth it. So that alone takes care of it. But Second of all, even though right at first it wasn't producing business, the name recognition, the brand recognition for my company, that that justified it. But since that time, especially as the snowball has gained momentum and size, it really has led to business, including what I would characterize as probably the most interesting business opportunity I have, which is, you know, I, I mentioned my international connection. Well, I've developed some deeply rooted business relationships, particularly in India and Singapore, and that has led to some really unusual business opportunities for me, by far the most interesting thing I work on, but also uh, quite remunerative. The largest publicly traded company I work for, uh, it, in my largest account, um, it started with the general counsel calling me one day because he'd read my blog and he had questions. And he liked my answers to his questions and he asked if I would be willing to come out and meet with the management team, which I did, which then in turn led to that piece of business. So. You know, right at first, uh, you know, it would have been very hard to short it, sort of show how the cash register was registering it. Right, right. Uh, I think it was still justified from the brand recognition standpoint. But yeah. at this point, I think there's a very strong case that it did um, really help me expand my business and not only expand it, but expand it in directions I never would have been able to do without the leverage power of the blog. Yeah. How does your company view it? Did, are they supportive of your blogging? They, they are so supportive. It is the greatest thing. I'm really fortunate. I, when I made the jump in um, uh, late 2005, early 2006 to become a wholesale broker, it was really a startup company with two seasoned veterans that I happened to know. 
Um, they're much younger than I am. Um, and they hired me with my not having any book of business, which is highly unusual in our business. So they were not only supported me in that respect, but when I started the blog since day one, first of all, it's my blog. It's not their blog, it's my blog. But second of all, they have never begrudged me the time. By now they see the value and the, the power. And so there's no argument, but they've been extremely supportive. And um, unusually they've never sought to um, edit my content or prohibit. Um, you know, I've done a pretty good job of self-regulation, I think, but they have never once tried to say, do this or don't do that. And that's really an amazing thing and quite a credit to the two of them. Yeah. And you do have one of those disclaimers on there. These are my opinions and I'm my uh, employer course, and all I, that I am stuff. A lawyer, so yes, yeah, yeah, you are a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's probably obvious, uh, somewhat obvious from the title of your blog, but, but what do you write about on your blog? What do you cover? Well, so my background um, for those out there who are not familiar with the DNO insurance space is the liabilities of directors and officers, particularly of public companies. And really my entire career since I started as a practicing attorney in Washington in the early 80s. That's been what I've been focused on. I, I came to the law business just as the SNL crisis or the early days of the SNL crisis was unfolding. And so um, right away, I was pulled into doing insurance coverage work for coverage claims arising out of failed banks or failed SNLs. And in those days, it really wasn't a specialty. So I was really sort of present at the creation of what became a you know, um, a, a very specific specialty within both the insurance space and within the litigation arena. I did coverage litigation as a, an associate, then as a partner for many years, most of it in the DNO insurance space. Um, so what, what it's about is, uh, you know, let's take an example everybody knows, Enron, um, you know, the spectacular corporate scandal, um, liability actions brought by shareholders, brought by the SEC, brought by other, other constituencies, all liabilities of the individuals who serve. Obligations by getting a third party contract that will finance their indemnification obligation. So that's, that's my specialty. And what I do today is I counsel public companies on um, not only what kind of insurance they need, but how to structure the program, what the terms and conditions could be, and then what to do if they have a claim. So my clients are 200 US listed publicly traded companies and, and a handful of companies that um, are not listed on the US exchange and are based outside the US. And, and these claims often or probably typically come up in the context of securities class actions, is that, yes, is that right? That, because my clients are mostly public companies, that's the sig most significant litigation concern they have. I do also represent a number of private companies and they're more worried about general commercial litigation involving competitors, customers, suppliers, uh, regulators, creditors. Um, so it can, it can come from a variety of directions. Yeah. And um, how do you come up with the topics that you're going to write about? Are you basically just following developments in the law or what, how are you doing that? What's, do you have a routine around it? Um, I do, and I would just say as an aside to anyone that's new to blogging or thinking about going to blogging, it's by far the single hardest thing of having a blog, because it has to be something that's worth writing about, and it has to be something I'm interested in writing about, right. and that's a tough combination. And it also can't be something that's beaten to death in other places. If, if it's covered well by other blogs or other uh, mainstream journals, I, I really don't want to take the time to write about it. So it has to be something that's as the best topic is one that's new, that hasn't been beaten to death, and that I'm interested in writing about, especially if I've got something to say on the topic. Um, so if I can find that combination, it, it's a good day. But if I don't have that there, um, I, I, what I can do is um, go to some reliable sites that I know generally help me identify topics of interest. And those run the range from mainstream uh, organs like the Wall Street Journal um, or the New York Times to um, sort of some main, you know, well-known legal blogs 
to some of the more specialty blogs, for example, that are in the, the Lex blog community, uh, many of which I follow, including some completely out of my space. I happen to be an avid reader of the China Law blog just because I think it's a great blog, right. and I admire everything that they do. Uh, so, you know, that that's kind of what I do. And it's, it's useful to go off topic like that to see what somebody else is doing, because it may not suggest a topic, but it may suggest an approach or a, an outlook or an inquiry that, that can lead to a blog topic. Yeah. Um, how much time, how often do you blog and how much time do you devote to it? To not just to the writing, but to the whole process of finding topics I'm, and writing them? I'm a fairly regular blogger, so it'd yeah, be yeah. an unusual week that I don't blog at least four or five times. In fact, I think it's been a very long time since I haven't blogged at least four times. And again, to those new bloggers, what I would say is watching my readership levels and what happens if I stop blogging for a day or two, it not only dips, but it's hard to get back, even if you, so you have to blog regularly. And, and that's a challenge if you're a practicing lawyer, but you really do to maintain that connection with your readership. But in terms of how much time it takes, by far the most time consuming thing for me is finding the topic. Because once I've got a topic and I know I wanna write about it, it just, you know, it, it almost takes care of itself. So the, the hard part is kind of conceiving of what I'm gonna do. And also for the blog as a longer term project, you can't just do day to day. You have to be thinking, where am I trying to go? You know, what is it that I want to be able to write? Like six months from now, I want to be able to do a retrospective on this topic. So I have to kind of build the building blocks so that I can do that piece that is, this is sort of the summary of that topic. And those are the things that get by far the highest readership. Yeah. But those don't just happen like that. You have to kind of build toward it. Yeah, I, I don't. I know you just you just did a, a, a kind of a, a, a I don't know if it's a year end or an annual uh, retrospective or summary of, of of the year so far. Yes. Uh, and I, I can attest to this. I do a similar thing at the end of the year, and that always just goes off the charts in terms of my yeah. readership. Um, and and before we scare away too many people from blogging, I would say you don't have to blog every day. I blog every day too, pretty much. Uh, but I, I know I've had people on this show, for example, who will say they blog once a week, but they blog on a schedule and the readers know that schedule and they stick to that schedule. So, yeah. you know, the, 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 the predictability maybe is, is part of it as well or the scheduling of it. Um, one of the things uh, that you do is go, I mean, you talk about going off topic in terms of what you read uh, blogs, but you also go off topic in writing your blog sometimes, right? I do, and you know, some critics might say it's a little self-indulgent, and I'm not going to lie, it is. But um, it helps me connect with my readers. I've written book reviews. I did an obituary. Um, I've done sports commentary. I've done film reviews. <laughs> and honestly, and also, as you know, Bob, I've done travel blogs as well. Yeah. Um, the the off-topic uh, um, blogs may not get the same volume of readers, but it draws a lot more commentary. Yeah. And it really, I help think it helps develop the connection. The travel blogs in particular, and in fact, those do get much more readership than my standard blogs. Um, I have had t told me in numerous ways that for many readers, my travel blogs are by far their favorite uh, part of my blog. And it's certainly for me, they're the favorite part of my travel, of my overall blog as well. Yeah. And of course, those can also be Google juice and draw in readers who would not be your typical readers because the people may be Googling. Yeah. I went to Cuba a couple of years ago and I wrote a post about it. And I got a ton of traffic on that. And yeah. it wasn't, you know, oh, I, I know it wasn't my. That's a good one. I, and I'm envious of you. I would like to do that trip as well. Yeah, do it. It's fun. Yeah. Um, if we if we ever go anywhere again, I don't know. Yeah. Um, let's hope we do that. Yeah, that, that is a question. And that's been one of the hard parts for me, honestly, yeah. in the pandemic. And I talked before about my international connections. One of the things this has done for me is not only do I have an international readership, but I have been invited many times to some really interesting places, not just places you might anticipate like London or Germany, but Slovenia and Estonia and Mumbai and Singapore and Sydney and Auckland, New Zealand and uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And each time I do those, I've written a blog post about it to the point where people will now say, gee, will you come to our city and do our city, um, which is really kind of cool. So uh, but the pandemic has meant that all of that has come to a halt. Ironically, today I would be in Sydney, Australia, 
if scheduled events had unfolded as planned, as the end as the end of a trip that would have included Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Melbourne, and Sydney. Well, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that's not happening. I know in the context of everything else that's going on, it's hard for me to feel too sorry for myself, but it is something that I miss and, and yeah. I'm, I'm anxious to get back to, to that aspect as well. Yeah, well, you get to spend the week in Ohio and that's a good thing too. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> Um, so, so something you said to me uh, as we were before we started recording today uh, intrigued me, and I'm and I'm going to ask you to explain it because I'm not really quite sure. But you you said that as a lawyer, I mean you're a lawyer, but you're not a practicing lawyer, uh, and and that you feel that the combination of of blogging as you know not as a practicing lawyer but as a lawyer has given you some perspective on how lawyers can or should be practicing. I mean blogging rather is that right? I don't know if I'd say should be. Uh, you know, yeah, because okay. everybody's got to find their own, right. what they're comfortable with. And yeah. I know a lot of lawyers would not be comfortable with what I'm about to say. So I, I know that going in. But there are lots of blogs out there that are good blogs that say, this happened. And I always say, so what? Who cares? Why, why does that matter to me? And what's the significance? To just say on Tuesday, the Sixth Circuit held X, well, so what? I, you know, I'm busy. Tell me why that matters. Tell me what what context it fits in. Tell me tell me what you think about it. Tell me whether you what you think of the, the logic of the court. Tell me tell me how you think that's going to affect that field or you know the the industry. I, I feel like who cares is a question a lot of bloggers need to ask. Why should I read your blog? Yeah. Tell me tell me more about why you're taking the time to write about this and why I should read about it. I think that's a really important point. That, that's one that it took me a while to learn as a blogger because I came, although I'm a lawyer too, I came out of a journalism background. And of course, the, as a journalist, it was kind of like, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Uh, and, and you try and not inject your opinion or, or your thoughts in, into right. an article. But what I realized after a, a while is that what readers want is your perspective and, and your opinion on these things. So, I, I mean, I don't always do it. Sometimes it is just the facts. But but I try and always, in some way, offer my own my own perspective as well. When well, I'm, you're making I'm a good point, Bob, and this is another thing I would offer to the lawyers. And again, I know this would not be comfortable for a lot of lawyers, but I think you're going to have a more loyal readership if you inject some of yourself into it. Yeah. I'll give you an illustration of something I did. I offered readers the opportunity to get a mug with my logo on it. And the, the deal was, I'll send you a mug for free, but you have to send back pictures of yourself with the mug. At, my wife took care of the mailing, so after 244, that was it. She <laughs> put it in foot. But I got back some of the greatest pictures. People took these, they took it to the Great Wall of China. They took it to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. They took it to their children's birthday party. One person took a picture with Ruth Ginsburg. There was just some great stuff. And not only did the people who participated in it love it, but the readership loved it. People loved seeing the pictures. So it was, it was just a crazy idea. But um, it worked really well. I also, a few years later, at my 10th anniversary, I did a 10th anniversary Frisbee with basically the same idea. Um, it was a way to connect. Um, and it was fantastic. And people are still writing me all the time asking for a mug or a Frisbee. And unfortunately, they've all been mailed out. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal that idea. I love that. That's great. Uh, the um, How else do you connect with your readers? What, how do you try and do you try and connect with your readers? How do you do that? Yeah, I, I try and use other social media. I'm not as good at that as I should be. And, and also, I just start running into an hours in the day problem. Right. I've gotten better recently with using LinkedIn. Um, uh, I used Twitter for many years. And the problem is Twitter is sort of its own universe. And you can quickly go out of your mind in Twitter, um, I've decided, particularly if you get sucked into the political side of Twitter. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, But I'm not as good at those things as I could be. Honestly, I, I could use a sidekick to kind of help beef up the, the, the social networking side. I think there is um, an untapped opportunity there to leverage my blog content more. Um, and I wish I were better at that, but it's really just a question of hours in the day. Um, I'm also very active in my um, industry's trade association, the Professional Liability Underwriting Society, or PLUS as it's known. I'm a frequent speaker at their conferences their webinars. Um, I'm doing another one again in early October for them. And the two things kind of feed each other because I publicize the events on my blog and then 
Um, you know, I, I meet people or develop contacts. So, you know, just trying to use things like that to expand my connections and my readership. And, it, and they, they, the two really do feed each other. Yeah. Kevin, if you hadn't started that blog 14 years ago, uh, where do you think you'd be in your career today? Do you think your career would be different in some way? Uh, it would definitely be different. Um, I, I don't know that I would still be doing what I'm doing now. I might, I might have gone and, and done something else. Um, you, you, I, as I mentioned early on, I have changed jobs a number of times. Yeah. So I might well have tried um, another venture, but I'm so satisfied with sort of where things have settled now that that idea has kind of you know fallen away. Uh, Bob, I'm sure you appreciate this, and I'm not as young as I used to be. So um, the idea of starting an entirely new venture. I wouldn't know what that's like. I <laughs> Uh, so, you know, honestly, I've found kind of a nice, comfortable spot for this phase of my career. Yeah. Um, you know, I've got the confidence of my partners. I, I've got a great team of people that work for me in my day job. Um, so, you know, right now it's a good place. What would I be doing if I hadn't done that? I don't know. I, yeah. You know, where would I be if I hadn't gotten married? What would my life be like if I didn't have kids? You know, those are big questions that are just hard to answer. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not trying to get you in trouble here, so we won't go down those <laughs> roads. But, um, have you what do you, have you developed any thoughts about what it takes to write a blog post that is going to get read? Do you have any tips on writing a blog post? Um, I'll tell you the things that I wish I did better, and and I'll start there. Um, I don't have time to pay, to make my posts shorter. I, I think to write a really the best blog post is short and punchy and says what it says, and you're done. I, you know, I, I can't shed my lawyer training, so I, I have a mm -hmm. tendency towards verbosity. Mm -hmm. um, so having admitted that weakness that I, I struggle against, um, I think a, my good blog posts, the ones that get a lot of readership, um, I not only say what I'm going to write about, but I tell the reader right up front what I'm going to say about it. This, this, this Supreme Court decision came out, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's an important decision or why this changes things. So the reader knows right up front whether it's worth taking the time to read the rest of the post. I think it's always important to uh, include links. Um, I, I wouldn't think most bloggers need to be told that, but some do. If you're going to refer to something, link to it, because that's real value to your readers. Um, and, and I said before, make sure to include a statement about why you're writing about what you're writing about and why it matters. In my blog post, I always include a section at the end called discussion. And that's my signal to my readers that, okay, I'm done talking about what happened. I'm now talking about what I think. Um, and people tell me that, you know, they kind of settle in when they get to the discussion section because, okay, now I'm either going to learn something or get mad at something. And, um, you know, and, and I, I do think within my industry, it has given me a bully pulpit to not only kind of set the dialogue, but actually to influence the dialogue. And, and I don't think I'm saying too much to make that statement. Um, so, you know, staking a position, using the bully pulpit, using the, um, the format and medium of the blogging environment to its using all the power it gives you, you know, it, it really can be a powerful thing. And, you know, making sure you're respecting your audience. They're busy. Um, they have a lot of other alternatives. There are a lot of different places they can go. Um, and um, understand that they're, they're professionals trying to improve uh, you know, their professionalism just as we all are. So trying to keep those things in mind when, you, when you're writing. Who are you writing for? Who is the person you're writing to? And what do they want to know? I, I always try and keep, I, mine is like a junior person in their company who, who knows they know to learn more, but they don't even know what they don't know. That's the person I want to talk to. Blogging is a bully pul pul pulpit. I like that. I like that idea. And yeah. all of your all of your thoughts about writing are, are really valuable. I, I you know I've come around on the length issue. I used to be a, a you know in the early days of blogging, the whole idea was supposed to be short posts and you know right. in reverse chronological order. Um, and I, I was I was, I knew a lawyer early on who would write these three thousand word posts and you know sometimes drop footnotes in them. <laughs> like no no you don't do that and. 
But you know what? They got read and they were great posts and they were substantive posts. And, you know, that's really the uh, ultimate arbiter of that issue. If, wow. if you're if you're writing long posts, but your readers are finding them valuable and reading them, you then you're doing a, something right. You make a great point, Bob. My blog is free. I don't charge anybody, but I'm sharing almost 40 years of learning. And you can read it or not read it because it's a free country. But my feeling is, hey, it's all there. I'm, it's there. I'm giving it away. You can read it or not read it. But from my perspective, you're making a mistake if you don't. Now, I, I have to follow up on that and deliver, of course. But, uh, you know, the number of times people have called me and said, hey, did you hear thus and such? And I said, well, yeah, I wrote about it six months ago. Right. You know, um, it's there. It's, you know, yeah. read about it. You know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it becomes an archive. Do you, do you think you're ever going to stop? Do you see yourself stopping well, at some point? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. I don't know. Uh, for now, I'm, 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 I'm set and likely to continue. Um, you know, I, I turned 64 actually today. Just Happy birthday. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it is a topic that rolls around in my mind, but I'm not likely to make any changes soon. I, honestly, for now, as long as I've got my health and I like what I'm doing, I don't see making any changes. So for now, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Call me, maybe, call me two or three years. Maybe you'll we'll slow down in a couple of years. It's yeah. quite every other day or something. <laughs> um, what, do you have any other advice for for legal professionals who are either thinking of starting a blog or who are you know in the early stages of getting one going? Well, there's some things about it that I about blogging that is that I would mention that we haven't talked about. One is if if you are regularly writing a blog, regularly doing the work to come up with blog topics you're completely on top of your game. No one is ever going to ask you a question that you haven't read about and thought about. And that's a really valuable thing. And the discipline of writing about it helps you organize your thoughts about it, helps you create a, a framework for ready reference. So, you know, I frequently am called to talk to boards of directors, and these are serious people. You can't waste their time. If they ask a question, you better have an answer. Well, the blogging discipline and process really sharpens those skills. And I'm almost always, it's pretty rare that I get caught completely flat-footed. I usually have got something right. to say. So that's something that I, I would say commends the blogging process. I also think it would be a good thing for a younger uh, professional to do. Harder because they don't have the background. But um, it not only will strengthen those skills, but as you and I discussed earlier, Bob, it helps you develop that profile, which is so hard for a younger professional to do. Yeah. And I think um, younger professionals obviously are much more adept with the technology and could leverage the blog together with other s social networking media to, to really create um, uh, an effective presence in a way that I think uh, would have been harder to do before those technologies existed. Yeah. For, for those younger professionals who may be starting a blog, uh, other other than uh, mugs and frisbees, do you have any good ideas on how to promote it, how to get the word, how to build up a readership? I was pretty unabashed right at first. I I reached out to everybody I knew, and just said, "I'm doing this." Here's you know, I I pushed it as much as I could, um, and and I wasn't shy about something as you know, a Wall Street Journal journalist writes about a topic that I've written about. I look up his email address and send him a link. Um, I think you need to do that. Reaching out to other bloggers is a really good idea if they're in your space. Uh, I, I find the blogosphere a very congenial and social world and people are very supportive. And so I wouldn't hesitate to reach out, make sure to link to their blogs and they will return the favor, which is a really valuable thing to do. So, you know, there are a lot of things you can do, even if, you know, you're, you're just starting and you've only got... 10 readers, including your mother and your dog, there are things that you can do to make that 10, 12, 15, 20, 100 pretty quickly. People aren't going to care if you're just an associate. They don't care. If you've got a good blog and you've got something to say, people are going to come and, and read it. Well, Kevin, I'm honored that you uh, chose to spend part of your birthday with us here talking about blogging. Uh, I'm sure you've got more fun and better that things to be doing. my best present but... the entire day. I've had fun. <laughs> This is great fun for me. Uh, and yeah, now you can go finish your post and go home. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you, and I really appreciate your taking the time to do it and share your insights and thoughts. Uh, Bob, thank you for inviting me. And to those of you out there who listen to this, 
If you have further questions, I'm not hard to find, so don't hesitate to reach out to me, particularly if you're a, a you know, a, a, a new blogger and you, you want some very specific tips or anything, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Honestly, it's been great fun for me and I, I'd really like to help other people have fun too. And uh, the blog again is the DNO Diary and it's at D and D, the letter, the word and O diary.com. You can find it. That's right. D-N-D-O.com. You got it. Uh, and uh, we are going to be back again next week. So join us again next Thursday, uh, 3 Eastern, noon Pacific, when our guest is going to be Tanya Forscheidt of Frankfurt Kernet Klein and Seltz. That's her firm. And her blog is Focus on the Data. So uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Uh, you've been watching uh, This Week in Legal Blogging, produced by LexBlog. I'm Bob Ambrogi. We will be back again next week. See you then. Thanks, Bob. See you, Kevin.